Hey, welcome to the online community of Fellowship Bible Church. It's really good to have you here as we worship Jesus this weekend. Uh, I realize that some of you are watching from out of state and some of you are traveling or even some of you are homebound. And I just wanna let you know, you're welcome here. We're so thankful to have you. And uh, if at any time during the service, you would like to connect with us in any way, just follow the link that's right below me right now in the lower portion of the screen and uh, it will connect you right to our connection card. And you can fill that out and someone will follow up this weekend with you. So whether you're outside of Topeka or traveling this weekend or even homebound, I think it's really good that you're here and that we could join our hearts and our minds and our voices together in the worship of Jesus. Let's join the service as it begins right now. i 
Good morning, church. It's great to see you today. Uh, this week we start our new series through the book of Philippians, and we're starting with the topic of joy in the midst of suffering. And uh, that led me to Psalm 23, as I was thinking about this weekend, and, and I'd like to read that for us this morning. It says this, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's stand together and let's sing to our good shepherd who is faithful and true.
Amen. All right. We're going to learn a new song together this morning. It's called You Hold It All Together. So I'm going to teach us the chorus here a couple of times. We'll sing it together, and then we'll move on to the song. It goes like this. And I believe that I will see the goodness of the Lord. I'm confident as seasons change, your faithfulness remains. Let's sing again. Yes, I believe that I the goodness of the Lord. I'm confident as seasons change, your faithfulness remains. Amen. Let's sing it together.
Lord, we thank you that you are faithful and true, that we can trust you no matter what we face in this life. Lord, that you can bring joy in the midst of difficult circumstances because you are near to us, you are with us. You're working all things together for good for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. So Lord, help us to trust you. Help, you, help us to find joy in difficult times. Help us to trust you more. Grow our faith in this time as we look to your word together and make us more like you, Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. All right, church. Say hi to someone around you as you have a seat. Well, good morning, Fellowship family. My name is Liam, and I want to welcome you to the service today. Thank you so much for being here to worship with us. Uh, one of the roles that I have here at Fellowship is working with our Connections ministry. And so I want to take a second to let you know that if you are new or you're looking for a way to take a next step in your relationship with Jesus, uh, there's a really simple way that you can do that. At the bottom of the worship guide that you received when you came in here today, it has a little card that says, Get Connected. Now, if you'd like to discover some opportunities and ways to grow, then all you need to do is fill that out, tear it off, take it out to the Welcome Center. We've got a great team that has a gift for you, and we can talk to you about some of those opportunities to connect into the community and life here at Fellowship Bible Church. One of the other hats that I get to wear is to give some leadership to our men's ministry team. And one of the things that our team is really excited to bring back this year is the Father-Son Campout. Now this is gonna be May 3rd into the 4th, Friday night into Saturday, and we've got a campsite that we're gonna be at out at Banner Creek. There's gonna be a fishing ponds and 14 miles of hiking trails and a disc golf course and good food, s'mores, just a great way to make memories with your son, with your grandson, with your nephew. Grandpas and uncles would love for you to, to bring out your, your younger guys in the family as well. So I would highly encourage you to consider signing up for this to mark your calendars. My son is five months old and I'm looking forward to making memories with him in the future. He's definitely not going to be staying out in a tent with me this time, but another time in the future we'll be out there together. So if you want to learn more or register for the camp out, head to fellowshiptopeka.com slash events. One quick mention I want to make as well is that we have Love Topeka out in the atrium uh, so that you can go out and look for ways to serve in the community with other people here at Fellowship as well. So um, if you are looking for an opportunity to serve in the community, head out to that table, talk to the team out there, sign up for one of the sites to learn more about what it looks like to, to pour out in that way. Um, and one of the other things that I wanted to share with you is I had a conversation with a friend of mine this past week, and he said that one of the most significant impacts on his heart for generosity uh, in the church in general, but specifically here at Fellowship, is understanding that it's not just about giving so that we can do awesome things here, so that we can have great programming, great services, and a beautiful building, although we are blessed with a lot of those things. But it's about giving outside of ourselves. It's about being the hands and feet of Jesus, not only in the city of Topeka, but in the United States and across the world. And that's why we make, it, we make an intentional effort to give 20% of everything that's given here outside of the walls of fellowship that have nothing to do with us. But it's giving into our local partners and community. It's giving to uh, emergency relief that happens when disaster strikes across the nation and across the world. It's giving so that missionaries can reach the lost where there are no believers in those spaces. That's what it looks like for us to be the hands and feet of Jesus with our generosity. And so if you are considering, if you consider fellowship your home church, but you have not yet started to give, I want to invite you to do that, to partner with us in being the hands and feet of Jesus in our community and outside of our walls as well. And there's a few really easy ways that you can do that. One is to, to go to the URL that's on the screen or scan the QR code. And another is to, to simply leave an offering in one of our boxes just outside the worship center doors. However you choose to do that is up to you, but a regular rhythm of giving is a way that we can continue to uh, do good works in our community and across the world. So would you pray with me as we prepare our hearts for God's word? Father, I thank you for your generous heart. You gave us your one and only son, Jesus. And if we have him, we have everything we need. And with that, we can then pour out all of the blessings that you have abundantly bestowed on us. And we thank you that you have provided for our needs, that we have clothes on our back, and we can be thankful. And we can be thankful that we have brothers and sisters in Christ that are here with us today that can worship together and encourage one another. 
And I ask that as we sit under the authority of your word, that you would move in our hearts and minds to make us more like your son, Jesus, that we would know your heart and that we would learn to speak, look, act, and do the things that he did in this world. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, hey, everyone, it's great to have you with us as we begin a new series called Finding Joy, and we're going to be in the book of Philippians for the next four weeks. If you have your Bibles, open up there to Philippians chapter one. And by the way, uh, if you don't have a Bible, uh, we have plenty of them for you, and we want to give you them as a gift because we believe that this time that we get into God's word should be something that you see and you have so you can hold it in your heart. And so on the way out, if you need a Bible, feel free to pick one up on one of those tables that are right underneath the, the top of that table and uh, take it home. It's our gift to you. We're glad that you're here. Okay, so we're going to be talking about the word joy. And as we talk about this, Paul mentions this in this, in this letter, this short four-chapter letter to the church in Philippi, using the word joy or rejoice 14 times. So it was, uh, it was a statement that he called them to, to find their joy in Jesus. And so if I were to ask you, how would you define true joy? I mean, true joy, the way God sees it, the way the word explains it. I grew up in the church. Hi, I'm Joe. I went to Sunday school, and I, I remember from my earliest ages uh, a teacher telling me that joy is the result of these things in your life, Jesus, others, and you. When Jesus is first, and you love him with your first and your best, you will love others the way he has loved you, and then you will find yourself in, that, in the right priority, in the right perspective there. But I'm going to give you an even simpler one, and here it is. It's finding pleasure in Jesus. You are called to take joy in finding your pleasure in Jesus. And as we look at this, let's get right into the passage, uh, because the big idea is to find your joy, your pleasure, take your greatest pleasure in Jesus. Okay, so let's take a look at chapter one, beginning with verse two. Paul says this, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with, there's that word, say it with me. Good, 11 o'clock service, you can say the word, great. So, in, and why did he take joy in them? Uh, well, Paul was taking joy with the Lord, he was taking joy with them. Uh, whenever he thought of them, whenever he prayed for them, it brought him joy. Why? Look at verse five. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. The book of Acts tells us that Paul went to Philippi. It's one of the first churches in Europe he went to after he landed on the coast and six miles inward was Philippi. And he met a group of women praying around or by a river. And they were Jewish women. He shared the gospel. They believed and that started the church. That was the first day until now. We'll learn about what now was like in his life. So let's keep reading. Look verse six. He says, I am sure of this that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So he was saying, look, God is up to something here. He's not finished. You may see, I think I'm out. I am very much in. God's going to work in you. He's going to work in me for his good pleasure. And he's going to work until Jesus returns. So Paul is just telling them, find your joy in Jesus. Now, where are you finding joy? Well, I have to confess to you that over this past week, I took some time just to write down a journal of joy. Where have I found joy over the course of my life? And I remember, I just have to confess, I found joy in some pretty crazy things over the course of my life. I found joy in music. And I remember when I was in college, you know where I spent all my extra money on? Music, CDs, you know what I'm talking about? I'm not talking about certificate of deposits, people. We're talking about those little CD-ROMs that you would put in. It was digital music. It just moved from analog to digital. It's incredible, and I've got to have this. I've got to listen to that. I've got to have all my favorite artists. And a ton of them were one-hit wonders, and today, guess where they're at? In my basement, in storage. And what is a CD player exactly, right? We find our joy in things that are passing. And some of them seem neutral, 
Others of them are pretty dangerous, to be quite honest with you. A lot of us are finding joy in all the wrong things. I mean, just think about the loved ones, or even maybe it's you who struggle with addiction. We find joy in those things, whether it's alcohol or whether it's other things that you can put your mind on, whether it's porn. We look at those things and they give us what we think is joy. They give us happiness for the moment, but they're not lasting and they're shakable. In other words, you've got to keep doing that. I mean, you know it, many of us who are consumers and we're addicted to finding joy in our next purchase, you know? And since we bought this, you know, that algorithm just says, you need to buy this, 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 and this, because for some reason, when we press, put it into the cart, something inside of us goes, joy. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? It's just odd. This world is messed up. And we can buy into it and find our joy in all the lesser things. But then there are good things to find joy. Like when I see my family, I just smile. When I see my wife, I smile. When I see my granddaughter, I really smile, okay? We can find joy in people. We can find joy in people. But Paul is saying, no, find your joy in Jesus. He is going to be the one who's unshakable. He's going to be lasting. And then he's going to make the statement, as we continue to read through this chapter, he's going to say, find your joy in Jesus. When your joy is in Jesus, he's going to give you two, cre two reasons why it's so important that you find your joy and take your joy from Jesus. First reason is this. When your joy is Jesus, you discover purpose in pain. Now again, welcome to the, no to the 11 o'clock service. And this is the third time I've preached this this weekend. And no one wakes up going, oh, I can't wait for the pastor to talk about pain. <laughs> it's going to be such a glorious moment. But Paul is saying, look, we've got to address it. We've got to address it because he's going to really detach joy away from just good things happening to you and just things that you want to experience. He's saying, no, we need to find joy in every circumstance. Unrelated to our circumstances and situations, we can find joy in Jesus. So let's see how he develops this. Let's keep reading in that first chapter. Start with verse 12. It says this. He says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Whenever I read that, and I, I bolded it there for you, because I wanted you to ask the question, what happened to Paul? Because that's what begs when you read that. What happened to Paul? Well, here's what happened. He was in Jerusalem. He was at the temple. He was preaching the gospel. He was saying, Jesus is Lord. The person you killed, he rose on the third day, and he's now Lord over all. And they didn't like that. They didn't like that because they were addicted to the law, and they found their joy in obedience to the law. And the problem with that is that doesn't give true joy. The law doesn't, the law points out, you're a sinner, you're a sinner, you're a sinner. We're all sinners. The law says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But the gospel says we are sinners, but Christ saved us. He lived, he died, he rose again for us. They didn't like that. So they had him arrested. They incited a riot and he appealed. He says, I must appeal to Caesar. And so that's where Rome came in and all these Roman soldiers took him. They took him up to Caesarea by the sea and he waited he waited to what, what would happen. He waited there for two and a half years and it was eventually taken to Rome. And when he wrote Philippians, he was in a house arrest in Rome, waiting trial. That could have meant his execution. And so when he says, look, I was arrested, I'm in prison, I'm awaiting trial. And they're like, we love you, man. We were committed to you from the first day until now. We, they've been supporting him financially. They've been supporting him spiritually through prayer. They've been just, they loved the Apostle Paul and their greatest fear is that he would die or be executed. And so he says, hey, what's happened to me right now has actually served to advance the gospel. And this is how it, be, how it advanced the gospel. Look at verse 13. It says, so it had become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. Now, this is an interesting thing. Think with me, if you've ever visited someone in prison, or I've done some prison ministry at different times in my, in my walk with Jesus, or if you serve or talk with prisoners, 
One of the common questions that you hear is, so why are you here? Why are you here? Can you imagine that being asked to the Apostle Paul? Hey, what did you do to get in here? He goes, well, I refused to bow to Caesar. I refused to say Caesar is Lord. And uh, I chose to pronounce Jesus as Lord. And Jesus has radically changed my life. And he's the one I'm here for. And so every one of them said, do you see this guy? He's a really cool guy, but my goodness, he believes that Jesus is the Christ. He won't bow to Caesar. That's fascinating. It doesn't say that every one of them believed in Jesus. It just says that everyone knew why he was there. That's why he says, my imprisonment is for Christ. But it wasn't just the guards around him. Look who else was influenced by him being arrested. Look at verse 14. He said, and most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So press got out there. Hey, Apostle Paul was arrested. Apostle Paul's our leader. Can you imagine that, that pastor's conference? Hey guys, we may be arrested. How many of you want the door right now? How many want to go? Those who remained, those who remained said, I'm in. I'm all in and my life is going to be about Jesus. And I'm going to preach him. I'm going to preach him more boldly than I did before because Apostle Paul is standing firm. He's enduring through this persecution, through suffering in the name of Jesus. Do you realize that's the value of Christian leadership? Where you're where you're willing to be bold and courageous, anyone who follows you will be bold and courageous. It's really hard. If you're a leader and you go, oh, I don't want to suffer. Oh, I like comfort. Oh, I don't want Jesus to have too much of me. It's really hard for anyone following you to want more of Jesus. And so when you think about this, think about how that influence was. They are much more bold to speak the word without fear. He was able to encourage the believers around him. And then look at something that else that happened. See, back in the church in Philippi, there were some dissensions and some divisions. And he's going to go, look, I know you guys are struggling with leadership, but look what he says here, even about them, in verse 15. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. Envy and rivalry. Some are preaching the gospel for what it could get them. Others were preaching because it really was the gospel. That was the favor of God through Jesus Christ, and it was for goodwill. It was, it, it, it's because it changed their lives. He said, the latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. But the former pro proclaimed Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my impris imprisonment. So in some way, kind of deluded, in convoluted way, they were trying to get at the apostle Paul by talking him down while they were preaching the gospel. And Paul says, basically, look at verse 18. I don't care. <laughs> What then, he says, only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I, hello, in that I, good, that's that picture. He was able, even though that there was conflict in the church, he was able to rejoice. Three areas then of what's happened to him. He was taken away from their presence. He couldn't be the pastor there. What's going to happen? God's still working here. Christ is going to be proclaimed. What about the church? They were going to have to suffer for Jesus. What does Paul say? They, they started that which government tried to hold down. They refused to be silent. And so the gospel was preached with more boldness. And then even with people around him, the prisoners, when he was offline for the gospel, actually it was right in line with what God had for him. And this has to do with what we view about suffering. This really challenges the common views and beliefs about suffering. And I just have to share with you that as I went through these this week, I had to even think about how do I view suffering? How do I view when bad things happen to good people? How do I, happen, uh, how do I navigate pain and loss and death and despair in my life? See, here's the three major ways that Paul's going to confront here. The first one is it's a setback. I just have to confess, hi, I'm Joe. I hate to be sick. 
Now, I, don't, I know very few of you who love to be sick, okay? It's just not one of our great desires. But for me, it means it's such a setback. It means I can't meet with people that I had planned to meet with. I can't do what I had planned to do today. So I go in my room, and I kind of slump down, and I shut the door, and I go into bed, and I just go, wake me up when I feel better, you know? It's a setback. When things don't work out the way I want to, when things don't work out in my timing, we can view it as a setback. And so I think because I'm viewing it this way, that God has put me to the side. He's going to use other people to do that, what he wants them to do. Because God only chooses shiny, happy people, okay? And, and Paul is saying, don't go there yet. Hang on. Don't go there. There's a deeper lesson here. Others of us view suffering as pointless, especially if you do life without faith. This is a very common view of suffering. And we're addicted to comfort and individualism, and independence and choice. We love those things in our culture. And so when we go through suffering, when we, when we have a loss in our lives, those are crushing because they keep us from being or doing or longing for something. And so it's real easy to think this is pointless. God cannot work through this. This is a major roadblock and I'm only gonna be used for God and he can only do it when I'm better, when they're better, when things get better, when I get the job, when I get married, when we have kids, when, we, when the kids leave again and then <laughs> when we get grand, grandkids. I mean, if anything that impacts that route, anything that gets in the way of up and to the right, right in our financial future is gonna be seen as pointless. It's pointless. And then the third way, it's a common way to view it suffering, is punishment. Now, just hear me out on this. I believe there are things you can do that are sinful and evil that you will end you up in a destination that are far worse than you could imagine. And so there can be cause and effect. But there are many things that are in your life not as a punishment from God, but it's easy to think that it is. So you get a diagnosis that you don't like that's going to require surgery and tons of therapy. And you go, God, what did I ever do to deserve this? And you look back and you go, and you think. When something bad happens to you in a week, you look at the previous week and in superstitious mode, you kind of go, oh, it's that why. Because I gave a half truth to my, my wife that, that, that uh, morning and I didn't tell her all the truth. And so God is up there going, uh -huh, all right, so you're not true with your wife. I'm going to let this happen in your life. Now, it's laughable to talk about it, isn't it? How many of us have actually thought it? We look back. Thank you for raising your hands. That's awesome. Thank you. It's good. The ground is level at the cross, everyone. It's good to have a vulnerable, vulnerable moment where we go, this is how my mind has been processing it. Because everything I've learned about the development of the mind and recent discoveries, whoever just got soaked over there, sorry. Okay. You okay? All right. Oh, those are keys, not, not coffee. Okay, good. All right. Okay, everyone's awake now. Good. All right. <laughs> Folks, God is not up in heaven thinking of how to ruin your life with pain and suffering. We live in a broken world. We live in a broken world. And if Jesus himself was rejected and despised and beaten and nailed to a cross, what do you think the direction of every follower of, her, follower of him might be? Okay, so Paul is going to really confront these common views because this was true in the first century. It's true in the second, in the 20 sec, excuse me, 21st century. Okay, so Paul writes this just in the verses we've read already. He said, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ, Jesus. Now, this is really important because he's saying, look, you might think it's done. You might think you're on the sidelines, but God ain't finished yet. He who began a good work is going to bring it to completion. When is that completed date? When Christ returns. That may be before or after. Well, well it'll be, it could be after you die, uh, but it also could be before. It could be any moment. And so God is working a plan. We got to realize it's a greater plan than ours. Second, he says, look at verse 18 again. He says, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. No matter what situation I'm in, no matter what circumstance I'm facing, 
Christ is going to be proclaimed. In prison, in the church, out in the world, Christ is going to be proclaimed. Your life is a platform for Jesus. Did you ever realize that? Oh, you go, Joe, that's why, I, you know, that's why you're on a platform because you're my platform. For, no, that's why we call you the church and not the building the church. You are the church. When you leave here, you will either make Jesus greater or you will make yourself greater. You're called to make Jesus greater as a follower of him. And that, Paul says, I take joy, I rejoice. But look at one other passage with me. Verse 29 of Philippians 1. Last verse, if you've got your Bible open, Paul says this, for it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Okay? So we like the first part. I am so thankful to believe in Jesus. We just don't like the second part, but also suffer for his sake. <laughs> Hi, I'm Joe. I don't like to suffer. I just learned though, over the course of my years, that many things in order for Jesus to go to places where you aren't currently, he needs you to walk in those spaces. And some of them might re require suffering. I met a friend, Pastor Forna. He serves in Sierra Leone. For 11 years, that country had a civil war in it where there were just, I mean, the worst human things imaginable happened in his country. He had to send his wife and son into Liberia to escape it, but he stayed. Why? Because he felt that the gospel needed to be preached to his brothers and sisters in his country of Sierra Leone. And so he stayed. He stayed. You know what? I spent time with him, and I just go, I'm unworthy, man. This world is unworthy of you. It's a person who stayed when it was difficult, who didn't run away and didn't live in fear. He lived in confidence of his faith. And so as we look at this, we just got to remember that although we might view it as a setback, God is saying, step up. It's, uh, it's part of my plan. You're, I'm going to use this for my glory. And instead of seeing it as pointless, remember, it's purposeful. It's purposeful when we experience pain. And instead of punishment, it might be a divine appointment for you to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Let me just again Proof text, the original followers of Jesus, the 11 who followed Jesus to the cross, only one of them, the apostle John, died a natural death. The other 10, they died. They were martyred. They were persecuted. They suffered and they died. And guess what? They counted their lives worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is not the American dream. This is the way of Jesus. Jesus is not our life coach to make all our wildest dreams come true. Jesus is Lord. He's Lord over everything. And so we are better when we find our joy, our greatest joy in him, and live to make him greater. So we come back to this thing, that when your joy is Jesus, you're, you discover purpose in pain. So here's my question to you. I want you to think about your life real quickly. Life outside of here, because you all look so lovely this morning, Okay. Life, I mean, really difficult life. This, this passage has really triggered a lot of people over the last services that we've gone through, hurting issues. Some have come here to fellowship because their life was so dark out there, they just needed a picture of hope. And so I'm just going to assume there's people in this room who are going through things that you don't know, and you're wondering, how do I get through what I'm going through? And I would just ask you, what are you discovering what are you discovering about who Jesus is in the midst of your suffering? What are you discovering about being a person of faith? What are you discovering about yourself when things get difficult? And here's some of the things I've discovered. I want to get away from the things that are difficult. I like easy. I just do. I mean, that easy button, I just wish I could, it could be reality in so many areas of my life. But here's what I've learned. There's sometimes we're difficult uncomfortable, awkward, trying, and frustrating are part of God growing my faith. And I've just lived long enough, 58 years now, to learn that that's how God shapes me and forms me to look more and lo more like Jesus, the, can I just, here's his phrase, the suffering servant. To follow him, you're going to suffer in some way. You're going to have loss. 
All your wildest dreams are not going to come true. And so we need to realize, we need to realize that and discover him along the way and, and, and invite him in and find our joy in him. Can I just talk to you parents out there? How many of you are helicopter parents? You just whenever, thank you again, hands are going up. I just love the vulnerability in this room. But the reality is, if I save my kids from difficult situations, guess who they're going to look to to deliver them from all their problems? Dad, can I have this? Can I have the car keys? Can I have more money? Can I have the solutions to this? I'm sorry if I'm ticking off some of you adolescents in the room, but the reality is, is you need to learn how to engage the difficult things in your lives, finding your joy in Jesus. And parents, your best to help navigate with your children their problems and their sufferings and their painful experiences, not to save them, but to help them find their joy in Jesus. I I know one family, and here's their motto, we do difficult things. (laughs) I like that. I would never frame that in my house, but they do. (laughs) They do because it reminds them when something gets difficult, they go, hey, who are we? We do difficult things. Do you know, church, we have got to be willing to do difficult things or else we're just going to shrink into be what the world is. And folks, I don't know about you. I've had enough of the world. I need more of Jesus in my life. So what are you discovering? What are you learning? And if you're in community, if you're meeting with people, let me just say, this is a healthy conversation. Hey, what are you discovering in your in your loss, in your pain, in your suffering, when we have real conversations, even if they might humiliate us a little bit, those answers, here's what I'm finding out. When we're open with Jesus, he gives us more of who he is. When you're humble before him, he lifts you up. Okay, let's move on to the next one because I have just a few minutes left. When your joy is Jesus, here's the second point. You discover death as Cain. (laughs) <laughs> Hi, welcome to Fellowship Bible Church. We're going to talk about pain. We're going to talk about death. You ready for it? Okay, so here's what Apostle Paul says about death. He counts it as gain. He goes, yet I will. Good, good. You're knowing what that pause means. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. Again, they wanted him delivered from Caesar's control of his life, set free from prison, back in their arms. Paul, this is what his deliverance is explained at. Look at verse 20. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. (laughs) They didn't want to hear him say that. Because they wanted him, we want you back. We want you back here. You're our pastor. You started this church. Come on back. He said, Christ is going to be honored in my life and my death. So I may be executed. Jesus is going to be greater than Paul. And look what his great statement is in verse 21. For me, to live is Christ, and to die is, say that last word with me, Gain. Wow, good job. Best job of all services here this weekend. Gain. That's a really tough concept. Do you believe that? I mean, you really believe it. So when someone says, oh, my, my spouse died, what's the first thing on your mind? Sorry for your Yes. And it does hurt. It, it will always feel like loss. And for us who remain, it will be a loss. And the scriptures never say, deny that, deny, don't have those feelings. Just be happy because Jesus loves happy people. No, it, it gives you mourning instructions in the Old Testament. And it talks about, about turning our mourning and finding, finding joy even when we're mourning the loss of people we love. I've had to navigate that through the loss of my father. I know many of you in this room that I'm seeing right, are navigating that with your spouses, with your children you've lost. And I think about that. But he's going, for me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. And then he kind of fleshes that out a little bit more. Look at verse 22. For if I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. So this challenges a thought in the back of our minds that goes off. I'm better dead than alive. Paul says, no, no. 
Don't go there because that don't move you to end your life. And that's not a biblical concept. You have been made for a purpose. Every one of you is priceless and eternal in the eyes of God. Every one of you is worth, in the eyes of God, Jesus living, dying, and rising for you. So don't go there because to live means fruitful labor for me. That means he could serve joyfully the Lord. He goes, yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. So he's saying, look, for me to stay here on this earth and not be executed, God's gonna, God's gonna help me be a blessing to you if, if that's the case. But if it's not, hey, Philippian believers, to be with Christ is far better, far better. I had a pastor um, that I served under my first job after seminary. His name was Ben Hayden. And one thing about Ben is he loved to do funerals because he says the funeral's not for the dead person. <laughs> the funeral's for the living. And how many, what a great opportunity to really, to really call people to the saving work of Jesus Christ who defeated death and the power of sin in our lives. And here was his statement. He made this at every funeral that I ever visited with him. And he says this, you won't know how to live until you know how to die. Now, it sounds interesting, but what does it mean? He says, once you have confidence at death, that the second you die, you're before the presence of Jesus and you're with him forever. If you have confidence at that moment, then just reverse engineer your life. If you have confidence that the second you die, you are with Christ and that is far better than anything on this earth, then you can handle a lot of garbage in your day. You can handle a lot of disappointment during your day. If you know there is hope for you and all those who have believed in Jesus, if there's hope that they have life with Christ forever, then you know how to live. And you can live with a lot of garbage in your life here if you know that moment is taken care of. See, when your joy is Jesus, you discover death as gain. So let me just ask you this question before we move on. Have you come to terms with death? Have you? Do you know what will happen to you the moment you die? And I know, I, I got it. I, I didn't think about this question until I hit my 40s. Now, obviously, I have known Jesus for longer, but I had never really considered or come to terms with my death until I hit midlife. And I realized I'm getting closer to meeting Jesus. And so it's easy to think of your life when you're young as, oh, that's way off there, and my odds are so little that anything bad will happen to me where I would die. But I would say this, I wish I knew what I knew, know now when I was in my 20s. I would have been far more courageous with my life far more bolder if I realized the moment that being with Jesus was far greater than anything on this earth. So here's the deal. I'm going to have coffee with you because I know there'll be coffee in heaven. I just know it. But <laughs> not that we'll need to stay awake because we won't need to sleep in heaven. But I, I think there'll be coffee. And in a hundred years, I'd love to have coffee with every one of you. We'll have the time in eternity with Jesus. And I'll just go, hey, hey. Bill, was, was this far better than that? And he will go, absolutely, man. All the things I was looking for joy, all the counterfeit places I was finding pleasure apart from Jesus on earth. I just, oh man, I missed it. But this is what we have and it's all about Jesus. I mean, folks, this great uniting with our loved ones, but mostly this reuniting to the one who loved us and gave himself for us, Jesus Christ we have to come to terms with death. So can I just tell you something? You want to know this. And that's why it's so important. That's why it's so important that you have confidence the moment you die that you'll be with Christ. And you can have that confidence. Not through anything you do. Not through anything you've done. Not for the family you've grown up in. Not the privilege that you have or don't have. But simply because of the power and the work of Jesus. Paul says in Romans 6, he says this. The wages of sin is death. In other words, all of us deserve death, but 
all of us have been given a free gift. It's a free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So that faith is what moves us from death to life. Faith in Jesus, not just faith, putting your faith and trust in the person and the work of Jesus. He lived for you, he died for you, he rose again for you. Don't move beyond today without allowing Jesus to do the work you need him to do in your life. I need you to save me because you lived, you died, you rose again for me. I welcome you into my life. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for setting me for eternity. And then, can I just say this? Live Christ. Find your joy in Jesus. I'm going to do some of your funerals, okay? So make it easy on me. Please. Seriously, here's what I mean by that. I meet with your family when you die. And here's the question I'm going to ask them. Does, did your dad find his joy in Jesus? Here's some of the answers I'm going to get. Oh, he just loved me and he was with me. I went to all the 1,400 soccer games of my youth and he showed up to every one of them. Did your dad love Jesus? Well, he always provided for us and he took care of us. Did your dad love Jesus? And he was such a kind man and very generous with his reason. Did your dad love Jesus? We don't know. Folks, don't make it hard on me, please. <laughs> it, live Jesus. It, live Jesus far more than you save to give your kids an inheritance. Sorry, kids. The greatest gift is Jesus. The greatest inheritance is Jesus. Trust me, money cannot buy off Jesus. Money cannot give satisfaction. Matter of fact, those with money, they will tell you this. I know all the things money cannot buy. And those are the most important things in life. So live for Jesus so that there's no one questioning at your funeral. We even were kicking around some ideas this week. What if all of us were to, even if it was just a gross video, just put, put our face up on a, a video screen and we said, hi, my name is Joe Hishma. I know you're all at my funeral right now, but I love Jesus. And I believe that I'm with Christ because I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ who lived, he died, and rose again for me. And I, I know we could talk about me, but I don't want this to be about me. I want this to be about Jesus, and I want everyone to have confidence in life and death who Jesus is. Thank you for this message. Click, okay? Folks, that would do a far better job than anything I could ever scratch up in my mind because they're there for you and to support your family. And you need to be a platform, even at the point of death, of what brings you life, what brought you life. I would encourage you to do this. I know some of you are just going to forget this when we leave, but I'm going to do it this week, just in case something happens to me, okay? All right, so let's get to that point. The moment that's the most important moment is the moment at death. And what does Paul say? To be with Christ is great, great gain. So church... Rejoice. Rejoice even in the midst of death because all those who know Jesus are in eternity with him forever. And I know this. I know enough about heaven that any one of my loved ones who are there, they are not saying, I wish I could go back to Topeka and be with my family. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. They know it's far better. They know it's far better. No hit on Topeka either. I love this place, okay? Okay. It's just not heaven. I'm sorry. Okay? With the fire last night, it was more like hell. Sorry about that. <laughs> Did you see that fire? I drove right by it last night. Okay. Let's, I divert. Squirrel. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> Despair. Despair. Some of you, some of you just feel lost right now. Some of you are feeling like your life doesn't have meaning. It doesn't have purpose. And you could count all the things that took you offline. It took all the things that have just not been or worked out the way you wanted to. Paul is saying, wait, the gospel's advancing. You may not see it. You may not feel it, but God's doing it. He's advancing the gospel through you. He's bringing you to places you could not have gone without him taking you there. I know a woman in our church, shocking discovery on a on a hysterectomy where the doctor came back and said, oh no, we found cancer 
and it's not just there, it's all over your body. It's stage four, worst case scenario. We don't know what's gonna happen here. I was there in the waiting room with her husband when we got that news and we sobbed, okay? We don't go, oh, thank you, Jesus, for this. We didn't, we didn't. We were like, oh, no, we've got our minds around that. But once she found her joy in Jesus, she said, every place I go is gonna be about Jesus. And every chemo and radiation treatment she had, it was about Jesus and making his name greater. I mean, almost to the point where the staff said, oh no, here she comes again. Here she comes again. I'm gonna hear more of Jesus. Yes, why? Because the gospel, her, her suffering would be a platform for Jesus. And then rejoice then. Rejoice, find your joy in Jesus. Last point, disappointment. Now, these are the things that probably knock me off kilter. It's the broken down car. It's the delay at the airport. It's all those little things that are disappointment. Things are not working out the way I planned it to be. Realize, you may think you're finished with it, but God is not. God is not finished. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So it's just incomplete. Everything, there's so much incomplete in this world. It's okay. God's not finished with you yet. I'm far from the man I dreamed to be. It's okay, because in Christ, he ain't finished with me yet. And he's not finished with you either. Rejoice. God's not giving up on you. Rejoice. You will understand his grace far better through disappointments than you would on a carefree life. Church, endure. Take your joy in Jesus. Find your joy. It gives purpose in pain. It sees death as gain. We're going to celebrate communion now. And so if you have these elements, I want you to hold them in your hand. And this is a point in time where we as a church are confronted with these two elements, the bread and the cup, that remind us of the body and the work, the shed blood of Jesus on the cross. And it's something the church is never to forget. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 that we are to do this until Christ returns. So we will do this so that we never forget that number one, Jesus is the one who lived and died and rose for us. And Jesus is the one we place our joy. So as we sing this song, just hold on to these elements. We'll take them together as a family. But as we sing this song, just confess your joy and take your joy in Jesus. Allow him to fill your heart with joy. And then we'll take these together after the song. Open hearts and open hands 
And we remember the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took the bread and after he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. He said, this cup is a new covenant, a new promise forged in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Would you stand with me as we close? Heavenly Father, we thank you for assembling us to this place to gather us in to hear the truth about Jesus being our greatest joy. And now that you have given us your joy, help us to live with it. And in the moment of our pain or loss, we, we ask that you would give us perspective, that you're not done, you're working in it. Jesus is gonna become greater in some way, in some way. And Lord, at the moment of death, we thank you for the confidence that it is great gain. It will not be a disappointment. It will not be a bore. It will be great gain. Being with Jesus is far better. And move us to be your church. Send us out into a world that's looking for hope and joy in all the wrong places. And I pray that we would reflect Jesus through all things this week. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you, church. Thanks again for joining us this weekend as we worship Jesus together and lean into his word. I wanna always invite our online community in to join us in person when you're in town or when you're feeling better and come and worship with a church family who is following Jesus throughout the week. You can connect with some of our events or any of our offerings for programs or ministries that we offer, again, just by following that link that's right below and you can experience more with us. And as always, one of the key traditions we have here at Fellowship is amen at the end of the service doesn't mean that God has finished working. Matter of fact, he is just starting to work in us as he entrusts people who are priceless and eternal into a deeper relationship with him. And my prayer is for you, is that you would reflect Jesus to everyone God places in front of you this weekend. Go now and be the church.